Hello, and welcome to another video. Uh, in this video, we're going to be going over the Space Surveillance Network, as we see written up here. Uh, and since the Space Surveillance Network consists of multiple subsystems that are very different from each other, there are multiple types of radio-based uh, systems, uh, multiple types of opt optical systems, and so on and so forth, uh, we're going to be going over a specific type of subsystem. They're, they are different from each other, but they all are very similar uh, overall. And uh, those are systems based on phased arrays. Okay? Now, before I continue on, I just want to let uh, you know, if you're watching this video, you're probably watching it on YouTube uh, at this point. Uh, but um, I also have, I upload these videos uh, to other sites like BitChute, uh, Utreon, and uh, Odyssey. Um, it depends on Odyssey because they have a, a file size limit, at least last I checked, so that kind of gets in the way of me uploading all of these videos. So uh, I'll put the links in the down there, and you can preferably... Instead of continuing to watch here on YouTube, go over to one of those sites and watch the rest of this video there. Anyway, uh, continuing on. So, we're going to go over these phased array systems that compose this particular component of the Space Surveillance Network. Now, what the heck is a phased array? Well, a phased array, uh, it is an electronically steerable radar system rather than a mechanically steerable one. Okay, now what the heck does that mean in plain English? Well, I'm sure most... Mm, little, rrr, I'm going through puberty again, I guess. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen um, the older types of radars that spin around on like, like airports, uh, maybe near some weather stations, uh, things like that. They spin around in a circle. Uh, those are mechanically steerable radars, okay? To point the radar at what you want to look at, you physically have to steer it and move it. Now, most of the radars you see only move around in the, what we call the azimuth, which is the rotation about the vertical axis. All right. Uh, but uh, some, particularly military radars, can also move up and down, which is called elevation, okay, in addition to the azimuth. All right. Now, that's all mechanical. Now what a phased array system does, and uh, I made a video uh, previously going over phased arrays, specifically before I made this one, because I knew I was going to make this video. Uh, so a link to that, which goes into more in-depth about how a phased array radar works uh, and what it is, uh, is going to be in the down there as well. But for purposes here, a phased array radar is basically a bunch of little elements, okay? Little antenna elements, all right, and they're all arranged in a grid up and down ways. Okay, I got some this way and some this way, rows and columns of a bunch of little antenna elements. And by varying the way the RF signal is fed to these each individual element, you could point the radar electronically without moving any of these antennas physically electronically at what you are interested in looking at, or an area of sky that you're interested in, in seeing if anything is there, okay? Uh, so it's, you don't have to physically move the radar, okay? Uh, so that is what a phased array is in plain English, okay? Uh, so let's go over, what are we going to go over? Well, there's one thing that we need to go over very quickly before we continue on. Most of these systems were designed originally for ballistic missile detection, okay? Uh, so we need to go over what on earth the ballistic missile does, okay? Ballistic missile flight consists of three overall phases. You have the boost phase here where the missile is being act it's the power is being applied to the missile and it is going up into space, all right? You have the mid-course phase here, which is basically like it's coasting, coasting along from uh, at the top of the, the uh, trajectory, all right? <clears throat> so that's the mid-course phase where the warhead's just kind of coasting along. And then you have this terminal phase here where the warhead is going down and to basically explode near or over whatever it has been targeted to explode over, okay? Most of these systems that we're going to be talking about work in the mid-course or terminal phase. They do not detect the boost phase, okay, generally speaking. 
we're talking very generally here. Uh, there can be some detection in the boost phase with some of these systems uh, for particular types of ballistic missiles, uh, but not all types, okay? Uh, so let's continue on with the purpose of this system here, which I've kind of already alluded to, okay? They provide early warning of when they were built ICBMs, okay? Uh, but they can also provide targeting so we can detect something and target it, okay? So that we can attack it or do something else with it. Um, and they also provide tracking of things that other than ICBM related, uh, uh, like warheads, okay? We can use them to uh, track satellites, spacecraft, space junk, random debris, um, you can use them to track it, let's say, for example, an asteroid comes close to Earth, you could use it to track something like that. Granted, you know, how well it would do that, well, you could do it, all right? Uh, so that's what they are generally for, okay? Uh, the original design was ICBMs, but as the things have, as these radars have been upgraded and performed better than they originally were thought to be able to perform, additional rules have been taken on by these systems, okay? Uh, now, if we look over here uh, in pink, these are the types that we have. There are several different types of these radars. Uh, the first one that we see here in pink is called Cobra Dane radar, and it was originally used to monitor ICBMs, okay? Uh, and we see, oh, we'll go to the map later. It was meant to monitor ICBMs for treaty compliance and things like that, okay? Now, some of these names might sound strange, like Cobra Dane. What the heck is a Cobra Dane? Well, Cobra is basically a Air Force general. It's an Air Force program that handles general electronics relating to general surveillance. Okay, uh, you can find that the Cobra Dane radar that we're talking about. There's Cobra Ball, which is a surveillance aircraft uh, station off an Air Force base. It's uh, RC-135 uh, Drew. Uh, Cobra Judy is another one, I believe, and there's several other ones that are Cobra, okay? And we'll see something uh, else with that down here in a moment. Another one of these Air Force programs type of things. Uh, Parks is an interesting one. This was originally an Army system, okay? It was ran by the U.S. Army. Uh, it was ran for, I think it was a day or a week or something. Congress shut it down, and then it was taken over. The radar itself was taken over by the uh, Air Force. Uh, PARKS, it actually means something. It stands uh, for Perimeter uh, Acquisition Radar um, Attack Characterization System is what this stands for. Okay, so it's a radar that is used to acquire uh, targets that are incoming, okay, and uh, characterize what type of attack they might be uh, engaging in. Now, this was originally designed uh, to target mid-course uh, warheads in the mid-course, and particularly their terminal phases. They're coming back into the atmosphere to attack a target, okay? Pave Pulse, it was a system uh, that was designed to detect uh, submarine-launched ballistic missiles. So, uh, ballistic missiles being launched from submarines out at sea. PAVE is another one of those programs, Air Force programs, uh, that handles particular types of electronics. Uh, PAVE is a little bit of a more well-known one. You have like uh, PAVE Pauls, which is this, um, PAVE Low, um, PAVE, PAVE, uh, shoot, I, my mind went blank. But there's a bunch of them, like targeting pods are typically, uh, back in the day, would have some sort of PAVE designation, okay, laser targeting, things like that. Um, PAL stands for Phase Array Warning System, all right? Space Track was yet, you know, it is yet another, this was the first one, uh, the first large phased array radar uh, that existed in the world, and I think it is the most powerful phased array radar still uh, on the planet. This was designed to track uh, warheads uh, for the fractional orbital bombardment system, okay? And we'll get into that in a bit. UEWS is the upgraded early warning system that was uh, created to re replace the paved balls. And like the paved balls, it was uh, designed to provide early warning and object tracking. So that's it for this particular part of uh, the video, and uh, we'll see what we got next. <clears throat> So the next thing we're going to talk about is what these things physically look like in general, okay? 
Uh, well, what we see by what I've drawn up here is we see the curve of the Earth, all right? And we see what looks like a block up here with some blue stuff coming out of it, all right? Well, this block is generally how these things look. It looks like a big concrete block, generally speaking. So there's a few exceptions, uh, particularly with uh, uh, the uh, space track system, but anyway. It looks like a big concrete block, uh, up, you know, like 10 stories high or whatever. Um, and one of the size is, um, almost, at least one of the size is at an angle. Now, some of them are steep angles, some of them are a bit more shallow, but one side is always at an angle, at least one side. Some of these, they may be shaped like a pyramid, a three-sided pyramid, generally speaking, um, and all three sides are at the same angle. Okay, we'll get into that uh, with one of these sides in a bit. So this is the radar installation, all right? Now, uh, this whole block is not the transmitter itself. When you see these things, and I'm sure most of you have seen them, uh, whether it's uh, for real, uh, you know, um, being out uh, somewhere or in pictures or documentaries of real things where they have these hexagonal looking patterns on a, on a flat block, a flat face of something, okay? Um, that, that's the antenna itself, is that hexagonal thing. And there's actually, we'll get into it in a minute, that's not a single antenna, all right? But collectively, we could say it is the antenna, okay? So the antenna is mounted on this side that has the, uh, the angle, okay? Uh, on the sides that have whatever sides those may be. One, it's one two, or three sides, okay? Uh, this particular picture, it looks like this is a one-sided radar. Uh, and so the blue will show you that the radar uh, is looking out in this cone, all right? That's where it is, is, it can see in this cone of blue here, all right? Now, note it can't see over the horizon, okay? It can't do that. The frequencies it uses don't allow it to do that. Speaking of the frequencies it uses, we can come down here, uh, and frequencies range with these systems from a little over 400 megahertz, I know I've written 400 megahertz there, but a little over 400 megahertz to a little under 1.5 gigahertz. Okay, now if you want me to use, if you're a, an RF Nazi and you want me, you're angry that I didn't use 1500 megahertz, well, if you want to go back to that, uh, that dated uh, ancient system, then why don't we go all the way back and just say kilocycles, okay? Instead of hertz and mega and giga, all right? But anyway, that, that's a little bit of a side. Uh, like I said, the frequency is easy 400 megahertz to 1500 megahertz. It varies between the particular system. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, Pave Paul's was uh, 415 to 430 megahertz, I believe. Uh, Cobra Dane, I believe, was uh, 1.1 or 2 gigahertz to 1.4 something gigahertz, I believe. But that's just the general frequency range. Uh, when you speak of one of these systems, they can range anywhere between there, depending on the specific system. All right. Uh, now, remember, I mentioned each of these. Uh, these antennas have sides that they're mounted on, okay? A minimum of one side and a maximum of three. Well, each side, if you want to call it a side, each one of those antennas, those uh, uh, octagonal patterns that you see, uh, has a width or an azimuth, okay? The width of what it can see, all right? It's, it's field of vision out to the sides, essentially is limited to a maximum of 120 de degrees. Now the Cobra Dane uh, is a little bit more than that. I think it's like 140 or something. Uh, but this 120-ish is a is a electrical, basically it's an electrical limit of, of what you can see. You can't see much beyond that with much accuracy with these types of antennas, okay? So if one face has coverage, a field of view of 120 degrees, right? Okay, six, if you have the center of the antenna, 60 degrees to this side, 60 degrees to that side. If uh, one face has that 120 degree field of view, if you want to see wider than that, you're going to have to add another face, okay, and you'll want, for efficiency's sake, to set that face, uh, let's say here's, here's the face that you have originally, you want uh, a better, uh, more coverage on this side, so you will place another uh, 
face at 120 degrees outside angle, of course, uh, 60 degrees inside angle, um, to that original face. All right, so now you've got uh, 240 degree uh, uh, field of view here. And of course, if you want a 360 degree field of view, well, you have three of these faces arranged in a triangle, all right? Uh, and that will give you a 360 degree uh, coverage, okay? Uh, now, the ranges of these vary between a few thousand kilometers, or did I put miles here? Yes, miles. I use, I use both, so sue me. Uh, frequency, uh, the ranges range from a few thousand miles. I think uh, Pave Paul's was like 2,000 or 3,000 miles, they could see, accurately at least, uh, to tens of thousands of miles in the case of something like uh, the space track radar. You can see quite far, okay? Now, remember I mentioned that those antennas, those octagonal patterns that you'll see on these that are collectively called the antenna, okay? That's called the phased array. That's the phased array itself, okay? Uh, those phased arrays are made up of, in the case of these systems, thousands of individual antenna elements, okay? I think uh, Pave Poles might have had like 3,000 uh, 3, or no, 2,000? 2,000, I believe Pave Poles was about, let's just say, for, for argument's sake, 2,500 individual antenna elements. About a third of those, if my memory serves me correctly, could actually transmit uh, energy out, and the rest of them were receive only, okay? Uh, so there's quite a few of these antenna elements, okay? Now, each of these antenna, antenna elements is arranged in something that is called a cross dipole, okay? And the reason that we have this cross dipole configuration is imagine your car radio or even your, your old school stereo with an antenna that you can pull up like this fork here, okay? Uh, this is vertical polarization, okay? What that means in the old days, these days uh, radio stations typically use uh, circular polarization, not always, but, but sometimes. Um, back in the old days when radio stations had vertical polarization, the antenna to receive the radio station also had to be vertical. And that's because the radio wave, as it's moving through space, it's going this way, all right? It's going up and down. So your antenna will have to be up and down, all right? Now, another way that you can orient an antenna is horizontal polarization, okay? So you'll see that if we have a radio wave moving up and down like this, this antenna, because it's horizontal, is not going to be able to really detect that radio wave very well. Oh, I see a radio Well, this radio wave is going this way. Um, but if it will be able to detect a horizontal uh, radio wave coming in. So when it's going back and forth, because it's horizontal like this, okay? And I'll probably do a video uh, that goes over a little more in depth of this type of thing. Now, a circular polarization is a little bit hard to uh, to explain without some sort of 3D picture, uh, but it just imagine that it's a circle, all right? Uh, so no matter which way this thing is oriented, uh, it'll be able to pick up those radio waves, okay? In a similar manner, this uses circular polarization uh, so that it can pick up just about anything, okay? <clears throat> now, the way these antenna elements are, uh, the, in all of these systems, the way they look, is something like this. you got a central holder, essentially, all right? A central thing that holds each antenna element, all right? This is looking from the side of it here, okay? So there's the two on the side, there's one in the front, and of course there will be one in the back. Now, this, this antenna thing here, this little piece of the antenna here, and this one are electrically connected to form a dipole, all right? Now, the one in the front here is connected to the one in the back to form another dipole, okay? That is what, you, what we mean when we have a cross dipole. So if we're looking at it from the top, it looks like this. So this one on this side is electrically connected to this one here. And this one on the bottom is electrically connected to this one on the top. And by varying how we feed the RF, the radio frequency energy, to these uh, dipoles, we get that circular polarization, okay? Now finally, this system can, these systems can track objects, depending on the specific system, 
uh, of a size down to 0.6 meters, which is, uh, let's see, if we're going to put it in uh, yards, I would say probably about 0.8 yards, uh, maybe 0.75. I don't, my, my conversion, I don't keep track, you know, I'm not going to do the math in my head. But 0.6 meters, so let's just say about, about that, maybe about that big, 60 centimeters perhaps, okay? Uh, so that's it for the technical aspect of these. Let's go a little bit more to the operational side of things. So how many of these uh, radar systems are in the world, at least the ones that we're concerned with with the U.S. First Space Surveillance Network? There are other ones that the U.S. has sold to other countries, but I'm not concerned about those for this video. Okay, how many of them do we worry about for this video? We worry about eight of them, okay? And so let's list them off here. Eight locations. Uh, some of these locations have uh, inst radar installations that are identical to other locations, as, at least as far as the equipment goes. Uh, specific installation is a little bit different. Uh, and some of them are unique. Uh, they're all one of a kind, okay? So the first one we'll see, I've just basically I put them in alphabetical order except for clear Air Force Station down here. It, uh, a trivia, if you, get, if you are in the Air Force, or these days the Space Force, and you are unlucky enough to get stationed at an Air Force station, you may not like life. Unless you get put in a nice one like uh, Pillar Point, uh, well, I think, it, well, again, these days they're Space Force stations for the most part. Pillar Point Air Force Station, that's not bad. It's uh, on a rock uh, at Monterey Bay, California. I think it, well, it's not Monterey Bay. It's up there, up there in a nice part of California. Uh, it uh, sits out on a rock, ocean surrounds it. It's very nice, actually. But anyway, some Air Force stations aren't exactly where you want to be, which we'll see here in a moment. So, if you get assigned to an Air Force, if, if your assignment has AFS behind it, you might not end up liking it. Or you might be assigned to a very nice place. Anyway, uh, the first one here is Beale Air Force Base, California. All right. This has the upgraded early warning radar. All right. Now you'll notice that I have put in parentheses next to each of these a number. That number is how many sides it has, how many faces it has. And in this case of this one, it has two faces, which will give it a, a, a 240 degree field of view. Okay. Uh, Cape Cod Air Force Station up in Massachusetts. That's one of those that some of you may like, or some of you, if you're like me, probably would not like. Uh, that also has an upgraded early warning radar, and it has uh, two faces as well for 240 degrees of coverage. All right, Cavalier Air Force Station, North Dakota. Again, I don't think I would like that one at all, but some people might. This one is a little bit different. Okay, this is uh, the Parks radar, and it is a single-faced radar. What is interesting about this one? is that it was, uh, I believe I mentioned earlier, it was originally part of an army system. And this army system uh, was intended to protect the missile fields of the Air Force, all right? And what's further interesting about that is if you look back way back in the day, in the National Security Act uh, that established the Air Force and also established several other things, uh, you will see that the army was given uh, the responsibility for defending Air Force installations, okay, but the, um, which makes sense because the Air Force isn't a land-based force, if, you know, if, if, if tanks are coming to attack your Air Force base, well, who's the better, who's best to defend it? Back in the day, at least, was, well, the Army, <laughs> you know, the U.S. Army. Um, but uh, while the Army was tasked with defending Air Force installations and the bases themselves, uh, the uh, security forces, or air police back in the day, were tasked with uh, securing and defending the um, air, air, aircraft facilities and aircraft and so on and so forth like that, okay, that are on the base, within the base, okay? Anyway, uh, back to this, the parks. This one is interesting, like I said, it was part of an army system called Safeguard uh, that was designed to um, protect uh, U.S. ballistic missile bases uh, from incoming uh, nuclear attacks, all right? Uh, and it was a much larger system. This parks is the only thing that really survives that's functional out of that whole thing. Uh, a, one of the facilities was built and did function, like I said earlier, for like a day or a week or something like that before Congress shut it down. Uh, that facility that uh, was there was called the Stanley R. Mickelson 
uh, facility, and the project was called Safeguard, of course. Uh, that facility is still there. It's got this weird-looking pyramid, a bunch of concrete stuff in, in the area. I believe uh, it's it's obviously it's run down because it you know it was from the 70s and, and it got shut down right away and basically abandoned, with the exception of this radar. Uh, and I believe it is privately owned now. They might be trying to sell it. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, so the parks is up there, all right. And then we'll come down here to Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, and we'll have space track of this one. This was uh, a, a single-sided uh, uh, radar, okay. And now the space track radar is the most powerful phased array radar that uh, we have. Uh, and this one, Parks, is the second most powerful, all right? Uh, like I said, Space Track was designed to uh, 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 detect uh, fractional orbital bombardment uh, system uh, warheads and, and, and missiles, okay? Uh, here at Erickson Air Force Station in Alaska, which I, I don't know if anybody would like to be there, perhaps there are some. It's out on an island way off, which we'll, we'll see in a moment, way off in the ocean uh, in Alaska. Uh, this, again, uh, has Cobra Dane, and it is a single-faced uh, system. Uh, and, and that's about it for that one. Uh, it's just on an island, all right? Uh, we have Clear Air Force Station, Alaska, all right, which is in mainland Alaska. It's not on an island. This is another one of those uh, upgraded early warning radar systems. It has two sides, therefore 240 degrees of coverage. Uh, Royal Air Force Flying Mails over the United Kingdom has an upgraded early warning radar system. It is a three-sided radar, so it has 360 degrees of coverage. Okay. Uh, Thule Air Force Base, Greenland. I don't know of anybody who has been there who wanted to be there. Uh, they asked me when I was working for a space force, what is now Space Force, uh, a space command agency, if I wanted to go, they pulled me into the office and they said, hey, uh, sit down, would you like to go to Thule Air Base Greenland? And I said, uh, in the summer or the winter? Oh, it's a year, it's a year tour. I said, no, thank you, and uh, was on my way. Um, uh, that has uh, the upgraded early warning radar, uh, a two-faced radar, so 240 degrees of coverage. Now, this one is in red at El Dorado Air Force Station, Texas, uh, and it was a paved fall system, two sides. The reason it's in red is because it is not destroyed. Uh, I wouldn't even call it mothballed. It's in this weird state where the stuff is still there. Uh, but the electronics and the antenna elements and all that have been removed. Uh, but the, the site hasn't been destroyed, at least as far as I know. It hasn't been destroyed yet. It's still there. Uh, I believe it is still government property. So I wouldn't quite call that a mothball, but it's not quite shut down, if you know what I mean. Okay. Uh, so that is it for these particular uh, locations. Now let's go look at the physical uh, in this locations in this wonderful map uh, with the boost phase inside the radar there you have to ignore that just ignore this boost phase thing for, for our purposes here this map that is absolutely amazing it is, it is Bob Ross would think it is uh, just beautiful uh, and very accurate representation of, of, of these radars all right so let's start up here with this is the uh, installation the upgrade early warning system at RAF flying nails. You'll see this this uh, dashed line is the, means it's got 360 degrees of uh, field of view here, uh, and it is up north at uh, at north of UK there. All right, uh, and then we have Tully Greenland, and you'll notice that this radar it's right here, and you'll notice that it is pointed north. Okay, over here at Clear Air Force Station, you'll also notice that this radar is pointed north. Now, uh, this is for early warning, okay, as we said before, missiles would be coming over this way, all right, over the north, over the pole, uh, and that's what these were for, to warn of those particular missiles. Now we have another early warning radar here, all right, in purple, over here at Beale. This one's pointed out over the Pacific Ocean, and this is one of those uh, submarine launch ballistic missile uh, things here, and that's what it was originally designed uh, to look for, was it SLBMs off this side of the, uh, the uh, country. 
Over here at uh, Clear Cape Cod, yes, Cape Cod. At Cape Cod Air Force Station, this one looks out over uh, the Atlantic. All right, same reason for submarine launch ballistic missiles. All right. Uh, there's some interesting stuff that was off Cape Cod back in the day. Some of them were called tech, or were called Texas Towers, uh, and I'll probably do a video eventually on those. But anyway, there's some interesting stuff located off Cape Cod as far as surveillance and radars go uh, over the years. Uh, okay, so down here, uh, well, let's, let's look at payfalls. This one here is uh, at El Dorado, and this is the one that is no longer active. Uh, the equipment has been removed. The electronics have been removed from the uh, building. It pointed out south over the Gulf and, you know, uh, Baja here and so on and so forth. Again, SLBMs for those some submarine launch ballistic missiles to, to keep a lookout for those. Uh, here we have space track. This radar points south. Okay, and this is the one that has a range of quite a bit. Uh, this one points south for very, very, very far, very long range. Uh, that was the fractional orbital bombardment system one. Okay, so we were watching for uh, warheads coming up this way, all right, from that fractional orbital bombardment system, which I believe I already mentioned is in a video I made, and the link will be in the down there. Uh, let's see here, we have uh, the park system here. This one pointed north as well, all right, uh, and the range was a little bit greater on that one. And again, it was meant to watch for ballistic missiles coming in, uh, the terminal phase and the uh, mid-course phase to attack missile fields here in the center of the country. All right, and of course this would launch its own missiles to. Uh, back in the day, not today. Back in the day, the it would have launched its own missiles. The system that it was part of would have launched its own interceptor missiles to destroy those uh, warheads. And uh, finally, over here, uh, we have the Culver Dane radar, which is pointing off to the side. Notice that the end of mainland Alaska is here, and, well, the islands, the big islands of Alaska are here, and this one's way off on a little itty-bitty island on its lonesome, all right? This was uh, pointed at the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula uh, to monitor originally the Soviet ICBM uh, launches and so on and so forth, the tests, okay? And so it uh, was there. Now, keep in mind that this uh, had a little bit, it's supposed to be 140 degrees or so, while well, these are uh, 120, the rest of them, okay? Uh, so that is it uh, for all of that. So various agencies uh, use this system. It is run by the Space Force primarily. There, there have been, uh, with other parts of this uh, network, uh, Army and Navy uh, components, but these currently and for most of their history have been Air Force. Um, other agencies use this, such as NASA, uh, for example, and they're one of them. Uh, they are a customer of the system. They are not the designer, they are not the inventor, they are not the operator, they do not control it, any of that, okay? Uh, and the reason I make that very clear is because I have seen over the years a lot of, not a lot, but uh, People of certain mindsets, who typically these days like the science rather than science, uh, those types of people like to try and claim that NASA has invented uh, a lot of um, stuff that we use today when in reality the military is the one that has actually invented it and uh, often is the one who has decided to let, let to allow agencies like NASA to use their technology. Okay, so with this system, NASA does use a lot of the data, but they are a customer. They are not the operator, the, the controller, they have nothing, all right? Uh, other agencies also use this as well. Uh, for example, this system was uh, part of the overall system, a major part, that helps cat categorize all the space junk. You know, I'm sure some of you have seen the space junk uh, maps around the show the Earth and then all the junk orbit around it. Uh, this system was a big component of how that kept, you know, how that catalog was built and maintained to this day and is maintained to this day. Again, other government agencies are usually nothing more, just it, nothing more, only a customer of the military who is running and inventing these systems, all right? Um, so, 
There's all sorts of things this can be used for, uh, including intel intelligence gathering, um, which we can't get into very much. But um, Oh, and uh, also finding satellites. If, uh, say, somebody's lost a satellite, you can use this system coupled with other systems in the, uh, in, in the space surveillance network, which isn't all military, I will add that. Not all of the uh, stations or installations in the surveillance system are military. The, the vast majority of them are, though. Um, you can use this system for, say, let's say SpaceX loses one of their satellites, okay? Uh, well, SpaceX is a bad... Well, I'll just use it anyway. Uh, SpaceX loses one of their satellites, they can't find it, they lost tracking, they know, whatever. Well, what they could do is uh, they could ask the Air Force, uh, or, you know, whoever is going to be their point of contact, hey, uh, could you find our satellite for us? And as, as, as has happened in the past, as has happened in the past, yes, English can sometimes be a tongue twister. As has happened in the past, uh, they'll find it, okay? Uh, they'll be able to find it and say, ah, yes, here's, here's the coordinates, here's your ephemeris data for it, so on and so forth. Hmm, excuse me. The ephemeris data is just uh, basically a catalog of movement, essentially, uh, uh, coupled with time. Uh, anyway. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed this uh, video and it kind of gave you an idea as when your space surveillance system you might think oh ooh spooky you know uh, uh, cloak and dagger type of stuff no not really cloak and dagger most of it's uh, kind of boring all right uh, so hopefully uh, that helped you understand one component of the space surveillance system uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, hope you'll come back for more videos in this type of series thanks for watching.